Well, welcome to this um, webinar on data in the time of COVID-19 presented by the College of Science and Mathematics at Rowan University. We're excited to share the point of views of very experienced faculty on various aspects of handling data in that time. As I'm sure you realize, we are living through very um, exceptional times. From the scientific point of view, that pandemic of COVID-19 has led to the production of an incredible amount of data in a very, very short time. These data range from basic virology to global health. And we are going, during that webinar, look at various aspects at which um, computer sciences, data sciences, and bioinformatics can handle these sets of data. Please note that uh, this seminar will be recorded and you will get uh, the possibility to see a recording of that webinar. We are aware that many of you could not register, could not attend right in time because of WebEx issues. So you will be sent a copy of that um, webinar, even though uh, we may go over time uh, at the end of that webinar. So if you cannot stay with us until the end, then you will be able to see uh, the whole thing uh, when it's recorded. On the next slide, uh, we have our panel of uh, speakers for today. Uh, let's first introduce myself. I'm Claude Krumenacker. I'm an associate professor with dual appointments in the Department of Biological Sciences and the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biosciences. I am foremost a virologist and I've been uh, studying fundamental research on viruses for the last 30 years. Today I will be the moderator of that webinar and I will also be the timekeeper of that webinar. So I will do some time check periodically. During the presentations of our um, speakers, you will have a chance to ask questions. So please use the chat feature of WebEx to ask your questions. And after uh, the presentations, uh, the speakers will answer your questions. So take an opportunity uh, to answer your questions uh, to these specialists today. So our panelists have an impressive uh, amount of experience in obtaining, handling, and interpreting data. Um, our Speakers are Dr. Ben Caron, is an assistant professor in molecular and cellular biosciences and the coordinator of the undergraduate and graduate programs in bioinformatics. He will talk about the use of bioinformatics tools to understand the genetic basis uh, that may explain why some people are very sick when they get infected while others do not show any symptoms. Um, Ganesh Chandrasekharan is a senior programming engineer and an adjunct faculty in computer sciences. He will be presenting a very cool application that is used by the National Football League uh, to implement contact tracing of their players and staff. Jack Myers is a computer science faculty member with particular focus on database systems. And prior to joining Rowan, uh, Mr. Myers spent over 25 years in the industry working with system development. He will be talking about how computer sciences and databases can be used to fight COVID-19 pandemic. Our first speaker is Dr. Anthony Breitzman, who is an associate professor of computer sciences and the program coordinator for uh, Rowan's data science programs. Prior to joining Rowan, Dr. Breitzman spent 20 years in industry doing data mining and software development. He will set the stage for this webinar on data in the time of COVID-19 by presenting data on the evolution of the pandemic. So again, uh, welcome to those of you who were only able to join us late and um, uh, be aware that this uh, webinar is registered so you will be able to uh, hear it in its entirety uh, when it's uh, uh, sent to you afterwards. So uh, let's go to the presentation. So Dr. Breitzman, we've heard a lot about that second wave of infection. Um, do the data tell us that we are actually in the second wave? 
Uh, thank you, Claude. Good question. Uh, actually, I heard Stephen Colbert talking last night about a third wave. And if we look at the chart, we see uh, three peaks. Uh, but peaks don't necessarily make a wave. Uh, what is typical in these pandemics, and this one in particular for other countries, is you have a lull in between waves. And the United States has never had that lull. If we can look at the second slide, uh, we'll see Europe. Uh, well, key countries within Europe, France, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom, they are smack dab in the middle of a second wave. And the reason we know that is because they got their cases completely under control, almost down to zero uh, during the summer. And now they have uh, quite a few cases, uh, but the U.S. never had that situation where we had the lull. So if it's not the second wave, what is it? Well, the, the United States is a big country and we've had different regions uh, peaking at different times. So in the Northeast, uh, New York, New Jersey, et cetera, we had the early wave and then we did have that lull over the summer where we got the cases way down. Meanwhile, the states like Texas and Florida, they had their first wave late and really, they never got things under control. They had s things sort of going down and now they're back up. And then there's other states that have been building since March and now uh, are actually starting to peak uh, in September and October. So uh, all these curves seem to go up more or less sharply. So is there any good news in the future? But the good news is that back in March and April, when it hit New York and New Jersey really bad, uh, we had no idea how to treat it. And so everyone thought ventilators were the way to go and hospitals are getting better at treating things. So now, even though there is a, a wave, well, an increase in the, the last month and hospitals are starting to be overrun, deaths actually peaked in April. And so what we're hoping, and again, based on what we see in Europe, uh, so I think we have a slide that shows Italy. Uh, what we're hoping is that it will be like Italy, uh, where Italy was on the news every day in March, where uh, they had uh, a tremendous number of, of deaths, uh, but now they're in a second wave and the cases have increased markedly, uh, twice as many as in March and April, uh, but their number of deaths has been, you know, any death is too many, but uh, much, much less than what they had in March and April. And so the good news is that hospitals know how to treat this, and we're hoping that even if there is a huge second wave, that the number of deaths is not like it was uh, in the first wave. Yeah, that seems very, very encouraging from that point of view. Uh, so we've seen a lot of these graphs uh, regionally, globally, representing different types of data. Uh, so the data scientists generate all, all these graphs. What else do they do other than generating graphs? Well, lots of things. So uh, my field is data mining, where we try to build models to predict things. Uh, so, for example, is a person likely to get diabetes or is a person a good credit risk or is somebody uh, likely to be a terrorist or commit a crime or buy a car or should the Eagles go for a two point conversion when they're down by nine points? Those types of questions. Uh, and it turns out that data science is used in every industry because these kinds of predictive models are useful. So do you have any predictions for the pandemic? I, I, I hope it gets better. Uh, so. Well, yeah, we all hope that. So thank you for uh, this brief insight on data uh, analysis. Um, this data on the evolution of the number of cases have been used really extensively. Uh, Indeed, the public response to COVID-19, for instance, has largely been based uh, on these complex data sets uh, that includes incidence rates, uh, positivity rates, 
the R values, which is essentially how effectively a virus um, spreads between people. So uh, I want to turn to Dr. Caron and, and ask, uh, since you are work in the field of bioinformatics, can you just first uh, briefly describe what bioinformatics is and then explain in what ways it can contribute to addressing big data that are generated during this pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Claude. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me today, Ben Caron. Um, so the field of bioinformatics is really the field about how we collect and analyze very large sets of data that are biological in origin. And so when I started doing research about 20 years ago, a lot of the research was uh, on a bench with single samples. But nowadays we have these instruments that collect vast amounts of data for a large number of samples. And the only really way to make any sense of it is through computational approaches. So I've transitioned my career into the field of bioinformatics, which basically uses computational tools to sort through incomprehensibly large data sets. And this is a really good time to sort of be in this field um, because we're sifting through large amounts of data. Um, yeah, and so we have a few examples and uh, why I'd like to talk about one of them today. All right, yes. Yeah, so could you just expand of one particular aspect that bioinformatics has been very useful in understanding the pandemics or the pathology or the spread of the virus? Sure. Um, can you click the slide? Awesome, thank you. So um, one of the things that we look at, and this is data scientists also do this as much as bioinformaticians, is um, trying to correlate particular outcomes of a disease uh, with the number of those cases. And so the slide you're looking at right here talks about the demographics or what kind of people are getting sick and what kind of people are, are passing away from COVID-19. And so this is um, the data from the U.S. from CDC. I think it's uh, about a month or so old. Unfortunately, we're well over 8 million cases now. But if you look on the left, what you'll um, see is that the distribution of the number of people that are actually uh, testing positive for, for COVID-19 is fairly uniform. Um, there's about 10% under 18, uh, maybe 15% uh, over 65 with a bulk of the individuals sort of you've gone middle age. Um, but what's really interesting about this particular disease, and this has been true worldwide, not just in the US, is that it disproportionately affects uh, individuals who are especially older population. So eight out of 10 of all the deaths have been over 65. Um, and it disproportionately does not affect children. And so um, only 90 out of a couple hundred thousand people so far that have passed away have been under the age of 18. So there's very specific populations uh, that are affected by this. If you click the next slide, please. Um, and so not only is this an age related thing, but it's also a pre existing condition sort of thing. So you'll notice that the death rate for people who have a, a comorbidity or a second. Um, potentially um, vulnerabilities such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, have a much higher death rate than those with no pre-existing conditions at all. And these are, this is, you know, it doesn't require a bioinformatician to see this. It requires a data, data scientist to create this, but not a bioinformatician to see this. Um, if you are older or have a pre-existing condition, you, you're more vulnerable. But what's really surprising is that early on, we saw a lot of younger, healthy, individuals with no pre-existing conditions that came very sick and passed away. And so we really have no idea why that's the case. So yes, a lot of people wonder why relatively healthy people all of a sudden you know, get very, very sick. Uh, one example was actually the doctor who discovered the virus. He was had no pre-existing conditions and unfortunately passed away uh, a month after discovering this virus because he was highly exposed. So in addition to be exposed to large doses of viruses, um, is there a way that uh, bioinformatics can actually tell us whether we are more at risk, maybe from the genetic point of view? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of different ways. Um, and I wanna first talk about a couple of studies that everyone's probably heard of. And these are definitely um, bioinformatic in nature. And then a, a couple of potential avenues that we're currently working on. Um, and so the thing that most people have heard of is that there is a, a disease severity and susceptibility based on your blood typing. 
And so uh, human beings have four different major blood types. It can be type O, A, B, B, or A. That's what we're on the graph to the left there. Um, and these are generally thought to be, you know, great ways to sort of solve crimes and do other things. But uh, interestingly, recently, they were used for a correlation study to try to understand if you have one of these blood types, if you're more susceptible to COVID-19. So what I'm showing you here are two studies. One was very early on in March, uh, taken out of Wuhan, China. And the study to the right is uh, recently October 14th, uh, published October 14th. And both of these look at whether or not if you have a certain blood type, are you more or less vulnerable to COVID-19? So on the left, you'll see, uh, this is the study out of Wuhan, a couple thousand individuals early on. In gray, you'll see the number of people that effectively have a certain blood type. So type O blood has maybe 35%, type A is 35%, and this is in gray. This is the number of individuals in the population. Uh, but if you actually look at the individuals that become positive, so that's an orange patients or have passed away from um, COVID-19, you'll notice that while there are more type O individuals in a population, there's actually many fewer patients and deaths if you're type O blood. Conversely, if you're type A blood, there's many more individuals who become severely sick and pass away, even though there's less type A individuals. So the study on the right uh, went on to confirm this uh, in uh, recent populations. And so they actually asked the question, if you're type AB or OB blood, sorry, sorry, A or AB or O or B blood, whether or not if you're in a hospital, are you more or less likely to go on a ventilator? And interestingly, what we found was that um, individuals, if you look on the right there with the red curve, individuals that are A or AB blood were much more likely to be put on mechanical ventilation than individuals that were uh, type O or type B blood. And so this is our first indication that some underlying genetic or physiological phenomenon can give us insights into whether or not you're susceptible to coronavirus effectively. Yeah, this is quite remarkable because this is essentially a respiratory virus, at least most of the pathology is respiratory and uh, having making a connection with blood type was really something that was not really expected. Is there uh, anything beyond blood grouping that uh, bioinformatics and, and genomics can help us uh, understand and, and create strategies uh, to fight COVID-19? Yeah, so you raise a really interesting point, and the point is, um, why blood grouping specifically? Blood grouping was used as a marker for coronavirus susceptibility and vulnerability because it was there. It was a piece of data that already existed. So there's lots of other metrics we have, like height, weight, BMI, all sorts of stuff like this. But the more effectively data or data points we have on an individual, the more likely it is we can figure out what the association is with coronavirus and why certain young people get sick. So I wanted to take a second to tell you a little bit about how this is a genomics and bioinformatics problem. Um, shortly after, uh, let's call it spring break, when, when everything shut down, um, the company 23andMe, which is a genetic testing company, came out with a plan to try to understand if there's a genomic or genetic underlying to disease severity. So um, not to just plug the company 23andMe, there's lots of other companies that do great research as well, but this is one of the companies that came out with this study. Uh, and what they're asking is, so the human genome has over 30,000 genes, not just one for blood typing, but 30,000 different data points. And so what this company can do is say, we have looked at 20 million people. We have looked at the DNA sequencing of 30,000 of the genes. That's a lot of data points. Now they can just send out a questionnaire to everybody and say, hey, did you get coronavirus and how severe was it? And so it's an incredibly powerful tool to understand um, what associations there can be between your genetic risk factors and coronavirus severity. So um, they're currently, I mean, the best thing you can do is, of course, they send out a questionnaire, make sure you answer it, um, and then it'll help sort of identify whether or not, um, you know, there's a linkage here. So just one more slide. Um, and so uh, that is one of the things that's currently underway with 23andMe testing. And there are some studies that I don't have time to talk about today. But I just wanted to give you one final insight into how incredibly powerful some of these tools are going to be for us, um, especially in, in combat, combating COVID. 
And so the first one's a precision medicine approach, and this is across all fields of medicine now. Uh, and the idea here would be that individuals will respond to um, or should be treated differently based on their vulnerabilities. And so if you are in a hospital setting and you're, they identify you as type O or type A blood, uh, and you're more or less susceptible, they might want to monitor you more or less based on those pre-existing conditions. Um, the same is true for the type of uh, treatments that they might give you based on these things. The second thing is what kind of new treatments can we derive from this? And so uh, we know that one of the things, one of the receptor targets for coronavirus is the ACE2 receptor uh, inside cells. And so, you know, what helps it helps us understand how to design new drugs to combat the viral entry into cells by doing these large-scale genomic studies with things like 23andme what that can help us do is identify new locations in the genome that will be new targets for creating new drugs and so if there's any hope for us to be able to make a new treatment it's by doing finding associations with specific genetic vulnerabilities and then finally, the last thing I wanted to say, and this goes back to Tony a little bit, but it's, it's pretty exciting, is um, we've been able to use bioinformatics to sequence the genome of thousands of these strains of coronavirus so far. And um, what you'll see down the bottom right there is a map showing the, the percentage of a certain strain of the virus. And the strains of the virus has drastically changed over time. So the strains that we have uh, originally it came from China is not the predominant strain in any of the rest of the world now and especially in the United States. So one unresolved question is uh, Dr. Breitman showed that, for example, there's a decrease in the number of deaths associated with um, a, a new recent infection, but is that associated with a new strain or new treatments? And those are the kind of questions that sort of we can all answer together with large computational approaches. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Caron. This is a very interesting insight of the evolution of these pandemics, both from what we can do to fight the virus and also how the virus is changing over time to get more and more adapted to the human species after it jumped from bats to infected humans. And, uh, and this virus is definitely now uh, adapting to its new host. Uh, I want to get back to uh, Dr. Breitzman and ask, uh, in light of what we've just heard, uh, if you can give us a brief example uh, on how data science and bioinformatics can actually converge to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, that's a good question. And uh, this is a crowded slide, and I'm not going to go through all of it, of course, but I, I recommend uh, people look up the Spectrum article. Uh, this is a very nice study that uh, shows the confluence between uh, data science and bioinformatics. Here we had a data mining project, although uh, Dr. Caron would tell us it's a bioinformatics project, but we had a data mining project where we had a supercomputer look at 17,000 genetic samples of 40,000 genes and found uh, this compound, uh, bradykinin. Uh, is in hyperabundance among uh, people with COVID-19. And this uh, substance uh, leads to uh, the symptoms that we see, dry coughs, myalgia, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, et cetera. And this discovery points to potential therapies, which I cannot pronounce, of course, uh, but the effect will be to reduce this uh, bradykinin levels in the patients. And uh, studies are going, are underway. Uh, of course, they're not fast enough for all of us, but uh, hopefully this uh, gives you an uh, illustration of how uh, supercomputers and data mining and bioinformatics can all converge to uh, find these treatments that were just unimaginable 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so again, I, 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 recommend the study, and I think that's all I have time to talk about because we have a bunch of other exciting uh, talks coming up. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Breitzman. It's true that uh, all these uh, findings were, were, would not have been possible just 10 years ago or even probably uh, uh, 
um, more closer to us than that. So I want now to uh, uh, ask our computer scientists, uh, Ganesh Chandrasekharan and Jack Myers, um, to give us their insight on um, uh, the design of connected devices and uh, how they do modeling and simulations in order to understand this current pandemic. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Claude. It was a nice presentation, Tony and Ben. Hi, I'm Ganesh. So today we are going to talk about a few parameters of, uh, can you go to the previous slide, Claude? Previous slide, please. No, the one before this, I guess. Okay, thank you. So we're going to start with like some of the basic things, even though it's, we all have heard it several times, how does the transmission happen? And uh, just to get the basics, the reason is without the uh, business rules, we cannot design a database. So myself and Jack, we like to reinforce some of those things that CDC has recommended for the last six to eight months. So that those are the rules we are going to follow to have the database design and have all the IoT devices do their magic. Next slide, please. So we start with the CDC recommendation. How does it spread and how do we do it? Like they say, like six feet apart. So this is one of the important business logic for all the devices to make sure that people have maintaining a six feet distance. And also the time, how long you are being, is it like one second, you're close to the person, or you're there for like minutes together or hours together. And also how close it is, what is the kind of uh, ventilation you have? Is it a closed room or an open room, that kind of a thing. And of course, the last two are like the basic things. Please wear a mask and wash your hands regularly. Jack, do you have anything to say on this? Uh, yeah, all this data comes to us from the CDC, Ganesh, and uh, it's pretty <laughs> obvious. But what we need in computer science to understand these transmission factors so that we can build systems to detect and we can build systems to model what's happening, uh, including things such as what makes a person vulnerable. And we heard Dr. Caron go into things like age and cancer and heart conditions. And so the first thing a computer scientist needs to know are some of these key transmission factors. Once we know this, we're able to design solutions to, to mitigate the effects, and we're able to design solutions to help us predict. Exactly. Next, please. So the next one, we see like what are the different ways the technology can help. The prominent one is the IoT devices. So when I say IoT device, it could be as simple as like a Fitbit kind of a device that people can wear it. Your cell phones, it's used everywhere. Like we have all the networks today, the technology is available today. So just the technology is helping us, even for this remote presentations, the remote working, remote learning, technology is giving, helping us in a great way. Uh, all the internet stuff we are doing, it's great. Real time, we are monitoring it, it's again great. So again, things are like, how it is susceptible, how much you're exposed, and how can be isolated, how, how do we monitor all those things? So that's the main idea of this uh, whole uh, stuff. Next, please. Yeah, the internet, well, before we go, before we go uh -huh. on, um, yeah. let's, let's talk about a couple of other aspects, Ganesh. Uh, the internet yes. of things I think is really important because um, we live in a new world where all many different devices are connected to the internet and we have you know we have new wireless networks and hospitals and so suddenly a whole plethora of new applications is available to us and um, so Ganesh talked about the internet of things and how that can work there's also been a lot of research and modeling as well and you see below in, in the red this is one of many articles many professional articles written about how to understand the transmission and control and a lot of mathematics and a lot of computer science is used to help model it. So for example, in this article, they, they ended up classifying individuals and they classified individuals as either susceptible, exposed, infectious, or removed. And once we begin to break down an information problem into different categories and classes, then we are able to model it. But until we understand exactly what we're trying to model, and more importantly, how we want to classify certain patients, how we want to classify certain events. We're unable to build realistic models. Let's talk about the NFL, Ganesh. Yeah, sure. And next slide, please. So here we are going to talk about, um, you can hear me, right? Okay, <laughs> suddenly, it's all silent. So here uh, we are talking about like a high-profile games. 
So as a person, we can say like, okay, we are staying home. We are not going to do any of those things. But what about the players? They have to be, they have to be in close contact. They have to do all those um, uh, interactions. How do they handle it on a high profile games and make sure they're not affected? First thing is they all have been given a device, like uh, they can wear it like a Fitbit or they can have it to their kit or they can have it wherever they're going. So multiple devices are given to the players. So and every device has a kind of a code, unique code. So they wear it as soon as they are in close Proximity with the other person, the devices are like, say, here close to each other, please stay clear apart. There's a red light and there's a beep sound, which helps them. Also, it captures a bunch of information about, like, how close are they, how long they were there in the close proximity. So it captures all those information. And at the end of the day, it's all updated in the database. And anything goes wrong, one other person is affected by or with a positive, then they check the data and make sure it's all been sent to the other people who are all affected and give them a warning like, please go and isolate yourself or get tested. So can you go to the next one, please? Okay, so how does it do? So it collects everything has a unique date and time and it has a unique ID. It captures the distance between each other and the duration of how long they have been in the same place and what is the uh, distance between them. The good thing is it is also privacy safe. So they don't capture the location or they don't capture the personal information of the person. They all get a random ID based on the random ID, whoever has the random ID, they are, that's how they are being. In case something happens, the definition is six feet apart, at least 15 minutes. That's one of the business rules they follow just to make sure like they're affected or not. And also the distance. So is it like a directly, are they playing a game? They have different rules for that. Or they are just traveling, or they practice session. So for everything, they have different rules to make sure the person is affected, or can they be close or cannot be close. And also, they have some tier one, tier two, tier three support people, because players cannot function by themselves. They have coaches, they are like tier ones, helpers like tier two. People in the stadium, people helping them, they are like tier three people. So they have different levels to help people out. Also, they don't classify anybody just walking through them by like just passing them. They're not close contacts. So they make sure it's all taken care of, the business rules are all justified, and then properly flag them. Again, to the last, if you are a database person, just to give you a feel for like how did they actually capture it. This is not exactly what they do, but just to get a feel for it. Like the different IDs, the distance in the yards, the duration. If there's a flag, say close contact us or no just to give them like, hey, it could be possibly affected, get you take care of it. Next slide, please. So that was a discussion around how we can help with uh, contact tracing. I wanna talk a little bit about how we would model things. Uh, Einstein said that if he had an hour to solve a problem, he would use 55 minutes just trying to understand the problem. And that's where computer science can come in. There's this whole language of modeling uh, which turns into a design phase, which turns into simulations. And there's a language of modeling that we use. Uh, there are some standards for computer science. And then we take those models, and then we begin to design different artifacts that can work in a computerized system. And hopefully that system is visual, and that system can simulate and give you a sense of what's happening, because it's easier to absorb something that's highly visual. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. And so what I want to talk about a little bit, and we're going to do a quick demonstration in just a second, uh, is something called graph databases. Uh, and a graph database is a different kind of database. It doesn't view the world as a whole bunch of data, but it views the world as a whole bunch of connections. These connections are called nodes, and they are in relationship with other nodes. It's a very novel type of database. It's emerged in the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And this kind of database can work really well in trying to model the disease state of COVID. Some people may say, well, what's the advantage of this kind of database, and why is it so fast? And, and the reason is that in a traditional database, you have lots of rows of data. And to try to make sense of it, you have to take it from one table and go to another table. And it's very difficult to do. In fact, try to imagine this. Try to imagine your friends. Who are your friends? And who are their friends? 
and who are their friends and who are their friends. That's actually building like, like a social network. In a, a relational database, you'd find your name first, and then you'd find your 10 friends. Then you go back in 10 times and you find their 10 friends and you can see what's happening as you go farther and farther out in the network, exponentially, the querying power is increasing and it's taking longer and longer to get the results. And sometimes you can't get them at all. But a graph database is different because a graph database has close to each other things that are connected. If I want to move out five levels, I will just move across the graph and very easily find the, the people who are in contact with you. So it's key for social distancing, it's key for maintaining contacts, it's key for knowing the effect of your COVID infection. Uh, I'm going to show you this as a demonstration. So if you could give me control real quick. Um, am I the presenter now? Hopefully I am. Can you, can you see this chart? So this is an example of how we can do this. And here we have people, we have like Fred. We actually and, see you and not your chart, I guess. You're, you're seeing me and not my That's chart. Jealous. That's not good, right? So let me see if I can, how I can fix that. I, I'm not, hang on, the joys of WebEx, Claude, the joys of WebEx. Yeah, now are, you see. Are, are you seeing it now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so this is an example of a Neo4j network, and we have people like we have Fred, and we have Barney, you may know these as the Flintstones, Betty, and Wilma. And what we do is we can model the relationships between the nodes to each other. So you can say that Fred knows Barney and Barney knows Betty, et cetera. And what we can do in modeling is we can build this kind of model of different people. And you notice that um, Barney is an infected person. So we're doing a class project right now where we're actually going to build a model. The model will include a statistical studies of different people. Like, for example, what percentage of the people have diabetes, what percent are a certain age. All those factors that Ben and Tony talked about, we will build into the model. And then we will infect somebody and we'll build algorithms. Uh, poor Fred happens to be a deceased person. But once we infect Barney, we will see how that disease could spread using probability and what we've learned from the science. And then we can also model certain events, like a political rally. And the political rally might have enforced social distancing. It might not have. It might be outside. It might not be. And using statistics, we should be able to model an infection and how it spreads through a community and how people who aren't even part of the, the network who may attend this particular event could be infected. And we hope that by using models like this, we can help understand the disease state. And my graduate class is actually working on this actively as a project now. Well, thank you very much for uh, this uh, insight into applications of uh, all these data that are being collected. Um, although we are almost reaching the scheduled end of that uh, webinar, we're still going to take about 15 to 20 minutes to uh, ask, uh, answer questions from the audience of that webinar. And again, if you have to leave now, uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, recorded and you will have access to the, the panel discussion and the questions as well. So one of the first questions that came up from the audience um, uh, sort of uh, uh, got back to the very early presentation from Dr. Breitzman. And the question is very practical in how does the US actually compare to Italy in terms of the number of deaths um, decreasing despite the number of cases increasing? Do you have recent data on this? I do not. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, what I can tell you, however, is that, uh, um, well, uh, I, I, I don't want to conjecture, so I, I, I have to look, look at the data more closely. 
Yeah, I think uh, the again without conjecturing too much, I think it's relatively similar. Uh, the the number of deaths does not follow the the up, um, upside of uh, the number of cases in the U.S. I don't know how it is locally and uh, how it varies depending on the um, the states that have been hit early versus the states that have hit, been hit uh, late. Uh, but uh, if it's a progress in medicine and treatment, then I think it will uh, be implemented in all the, the states. Another question that uh, came up uh, is uh, directed to uh, uh, Ganesh, um, is essentially with all these uh, tracing like you presented for uh, NFL, uh, is there any yeah. privacy concerns uh, about collecting all this data about people who they meet, who they contact, and, and other things like that? Yeah, but that's a good one. The, thing they, they, the one thing they made sure is like they are not collecting the personal information, they are not collecting the location information, no GPS information. All they have is a random ID matching to a random ID, whether those two IDs are together or not. So if one person happen to have positive, they just send a note to the other ID. It's like you were at some point of time in close contact with this ID, this person has been treated. Do you want to self quarantine? Go and check. That's all they're trying to do. They're not picking on individuals with any information. But they still have the information between who met who, right? Yes, that, that they have some random numbers. This random number met this random number. Of course, someone has it like this ID is associated to a player. But it's not available for everyone. It is very top level NFL level. They have this information just to make sure the person is treated or not, or taken care of or not. Yeah. So the, uh, the this is a very the NFL is a very structured organization with these different levels of players and staff and and who contacts whom is is very very controlled. Uh, do you see a possibility for the same technology to actually be applied? to other organizations, maybe a university or college or something like that? Uh, like even the New Jersey government has done, like New Jersey Department of Health, they released an app for all the uh, users, smartphone users, COVID Alert NJ. It uses almost a similar technology. Of course, it's not that high end. It uses your cell phone Bluetooth. They say you have uh, installed it, I have installed it, and we are in close contact at least in six feet for 10 minutes. It exchanges a code. This phone has been contacted with this phone. If one of the person has been uh, infected or been tested positive, then you can always opt to say like, okay, whoever was in close contact with me, please go and check. So you just press a button, it automatically goes and updates all the phones and say like, somebody you have been contact in the last 24 hours or 48 hours has been infected with COVID, please go and take a look. So it's, it's available. Only thing is we all have to install the app and make sure the Bluetooth is on and, we, and it's pretty secure. They don't pass on the information to Google or Apple. It all stays within the New Jersey uh, healthcare and they don't collect any personal information just a bluetooth that's it so just just to continue on this and this idea of contact tracing the nfl can sort of implement and sort of force the people to actually participate but if you want to apply that to you know any public organization any college you need some sort of you know people self-disclosing who they contact um, so is there you know if you know how many people you need to participate for actually contact tracing to be effective uh, last time i checked with the new jersey app 260,000 people have participated think about the population of new jersey 260,000 that's like maybe one percent two percent max that's that's nothing people have to join in millions then only it can be effective with like around eight to nine million population i guess new jersey has 260,000 people that's Peanuts. What people have to participate. So, so there are a number of questions about, you know, essentially following up on, on this, but not necessarily on contact tracing. It's more about the databases. And, and I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Caron and, and ask databases like uh, 23andMe uh, ask questions, they ask people to participate. Um, how do databases like 23andMe and other databases actually um, ensure that they have this data that they collect are actually accurate? Uh, how do you check that all the databases that all of you are actually using 
are actually made of real data. So I can sort of mention something about that with 23andMe. Um, the interesting thing about the, these companies of 23andMe is that when you submit your sample for DNA sequencing, they collect all of that data and it's actually about 700,000 data points all at once. It's stored in a database and then they look to see if there's any associations with any diseases or traits or other things that, you know, can you smell um, asparagus when you pee kind of thing. They're really funny things. So the, the thing that's fascinating about that is they always have the scientific data on hand and it's about whether or not they ask good questions. So if you've ever done one of these studies, what you'll find is that um, you will frequently get emails from 23andMe that they've come up with a new question that they want to analyze. And it doesn't mean you need to submit your DNA sample again. It just means that you need to provide the data. And, uh, sorry, provide the um, association or the question. And so for coronavirus, they already have 20 million samples of data. It's up to 23andMe to ask a very good question. And so that's the key about whether the data is reliable is are you asking the right question? So they can't ask a very subjective question, something like, how sick did you feel? Well, that's going to be different for lots of people. But what they can ask is very definitive questions like, were you hospitalized? And that's a yes or no question. Did you go on a mechanical ventilator? That's a yes or no question. And so by asking good questions uh, of all the people that have sort of already been genetically tested, they can get a, a much more reliable answers in the end. And so that's probably the best way to get a good quality answer. But that, that implies that they trust the people telling them the information. I mean, we know now that it's very easy for, you know, some people to sort of influence polls, influence type of data. I can answer to uh, 23andMe and say, I've been hospitalized when I've not been hospitalized. Is there, is there a way that these uh, databases, any kind of databases can actually check that the information they receive is correct information? I mean, that's a very good and challenging question. I don't, I don't think that 23 has, 23andMe has any good way of verifying uh, whether or not that is true. I think we sort of all have to collectively hope that, you know, if you were going to take the time in your day, which is significant, to go through and answer an email for 23andMe, hopefully you don't have <laughs> a malevolent response. But you raise a very good point. Um, it, certainly these things can be influenced. There was actually a, a recent example of this. Um, I won't say where or by who. I think it was a, an NPR article that I had heard that individuals were proposing to not get tested. So there was not an increase in positivity cases. And so certainly that's a good example of how some of these databases uh, can be subject to manipulation and problematic. Yeah, I think this is this is this relates to a question that, from the audience as well, uh, and that's more addressed to uh, Dr. Breitzman because he presented the, the numbers. So, well, there's there's this argument that um, we have more cases because we do more testing, and um, should how how can we address this? Because obviously the number of testing does not influence the number of cases that are run. Um, so can, can you sort of uh, comment on, on this aspect? Yes, that, that argument falls apart very quickly as soon as you look at the data. Uh, so New York, uh, which on the second or third slide we saw had uh, a big peak and then the cases went way down. New York can, uh, does more testing than any other state uh, by far, and they do something like 700,000 case tests a week. Uh, since August, and as they were ramping up their testing, their number of cases continued to go down. Uh, and that's also true in Europe and Asia and everywhere we look where testing is much, much higher than it was uh, during the early peaks. And uh, it was also shown in Ben's slides where we see that a lot of the younger and middle-aged uh, people get tests and they, they're not positive and they do not uh, subsequently get sick. So, yes, uh, all data points to more testing does not mean more cases. Yes, thank you. I would actually argue that less testing would lead to more cases because we would actually not be able to control the, 
the epidemics and know where the virus actually is. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have another uh, question um, that's addressed to uh, um, Jack Myers. Um, so in it, here I have to read it because this is not my field of expertise. Um, what are the advantages of graph databases compared with semantic data structures like XML, RDF, and ontologies? That's a great, great question. I love that. Um, then please explain it to me because I have no idea what this is. All right. So an XML document is just a document that describes you, and it, ha it takes information and it tags it. So I could say, if you're Fred, I could say you have diabetes. I could say you're 48 years old. I could give your height and your weight. So it's a document that can, ca can categorize and tag information about a person. So that's not really a database, but an XML document is a perfect way for us to build the nodes in a graph database. That was point one. Point two talked about something called RDF. And RDF is a semantic way to represent information. So Claude, I could say, I know you. And it, it, an RDF is kind of in a subject verb object structure. So it gives some semantic meaning to you and I because we know each other. And that should sound familiar because that's exactly how we use Neo4j to build up our network of nodes that knew each other. But the difference is that RDF is just a triple. It's just, I know you. But then I, I would need another triple that you know Dr. Breitzman. And so in, in absence of connectivity, we just have triples all over the place. In a database, they could all be stored in a giant network and queried. And the third part was ontologies, and ontologies are fantastic because ontologies are basic ways to categorize information and label things. And uh, for example, you can label a, a kidney disease and you can label a, a type of kidney disease. There are medical ontologies and they would apply very well in cases of COVID analysis. And you're probably familiar with one called MESH. It's a medical subject uh, te taxonomy. And so in Neo4j, you can actually give labels all the way down the, the taxonomy. So you can give labels of, I have a kidney disease, and then you could search for people that have a kidney disease. And then you could search people that have a certain kind of kidney disease by giving them different labels. And you would label them according to that categorization system. So you could do very general queries, and you could use very specific queries. So I would say to the questioner that these tools are not really databases, but they're definitely techniques that we can use to help build better models. If that makes sense, Claude. Yes, yes, I, it does make sense. Yeah. So I, I, I want to finish with one last question that I want to ask to essentially uh, all of you, uh, because you are dealing with data. Uh, and that question is, what kind of data do you think is currently missing uh, for us to really effectively address that pandemic? What would you like to know uh, that will uh, essentially really, really help um, to move forward in your respective fields uh, in order to tackle that pandemic. When is the vaccine? Okay, so play, uh, Ruby. No, my question will be, when are we getting the vaccine? Uh, now, the data will be like the contact tracing. So people have to come up and say like, yes, we uh, like a person who has it like a yes, test positive because people don't do that for several reasons. So that's the problem. That's one of the main issues that I see, especially, and also install app or whatever we need to do to help the government and help the doctors. Come out and say, come out and do stuff. Yeah, I would like to add on to that and say that um, I think the silver bullet that everybody's hoping for is a vaccine. And, um, you know, there are many vaccines we've developed over the years, like the polio vaccine, which is over 99% effective and lasts for 18 years. Whereas the vaccines we're currently developing uh, may be 50% effective and for a, an unknown period of time. And that's incredibly important and uh, have, will have a high potency in terms of limiting disease spread. But one of the things that we could do to understand and develop better vaccines is to understand how this genome of the virus is changing over the time, what frequency is it's changing at, and what populations we can target. So there may be different vaccines that, in different strains of the virus that we can develop to make combinatorial vaccines like we use for the flu 
to make it a much better vaccine, a much better bullet. So I would like to see more genome sequencing and analysis. I think that'd be incredibly important. Ben, I just read an article about the fact that immunity for people who have contracted COVID is very short and maybe as low as three months where the antibodies begin to leave their system. So do you, do you also think it would be useful to have uh, reinfection statistics, people who've, who've been infected with COVID and get come out with a second case of it? We don't seem to have much of that data, do we, Ben? There, yeah, unfortunately, many. well, the good news is that there haven't been many reinfections. There's been very few. Um, but you're right, I haven't seen that antibody titers decrease dramatically um, in short periods of time. Um, unfortunately, I think that a lot of the data that we're going to wind up being most useful will be data that we look at retrospectively a year or two from now. And that for the genomic testing, that's probably true. Yeah, I certainly agree. Well, thank you all for uh, answering all these questions and uh, uh, giving uh, very uh, insightful uh, precisions to the to the audience. Uh, before we finish, I would maybe ask uh, Jack Myers to conclude by giving us some information about the various programs at Rowan for those of you who may be interested in learning more about these programs and maybe uh, start a career in these fields. Yeah, thank you, Claude. So you've, you've noticed now that there's a lot of interplay between these disciplines and Rowan has three master's degrees. Uh, we have the bioinformatics masters and that's a very interesting master's degree. It mixes in biological, biomedical, biochemical systems. And it also deals with information. It's a hot new area. Uh, it, as you can see, it's really key in pharmaceutical research. And it's, it's an emerging discipline, I think. We also have an MS in data science, where you learn to sort of mine data. You're looking for trends, you're doing machine learning. You've probably heard the term big data. And that's the ability to really Try to find those needles in a haystack. We have so much information. How can we actually manage it? How can we use probability and statistics to find answers to questions we haven't even asked yet? And then lastly, we have a master's in computer science. And computer science gives you some of the tools, some of the programming aspects, some of the database aspects, some of the, the skills and competencies you need to actually work in bioinformatics and work in data science. I think what's really nice, Claude, is that all of these master's programs, they allow you to take courses from the other disciplines. So it really is like a continuum. And as you can see, we're not quite as separate as you might think on the surface. Yes, thank you very much. It's true that uh, all of these uh, approaches are very, very complementary and uh, we cannot do one without the others. And, and these programs are designed so that uh, you can actually dip in all and the different programs. So if you want to know more about uh, these programs, there will be a graduate information session uh, scheduled on Monday, November 2nd at 6 p.m. Uh, you can look at uh, global.rowan.edu slash events to find information about this. You can also find more information about these programs if you look at the website of the College of Sciences and Mathematics, csm.roban.edu. So we're reaching the end of this webinar. I want to thank all the panelists for their insights and for sharing their knowledge. I certainly learned a lot, um, and I hope that uh, you in the audience also uh, learned a lot about uh, data in the time of COVID-19 and about the research and programs that are available at uh, Rowan CSM. Uh, so in the name of the panelists and organizers uh, of this webinar, I want to thank all the attendees for joining us today. Uh, you will receive a brief feedback survey shortly and we will appreciate your comments. You will also receive uh, a link to the uh, fully uh, recorded version of that webinar. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, goodbye and stay safe.